baby at high risk. And so here we have that post-term baby. So we always worry about your preterm babies, but babies that are cooking too long could be a problem. Thank you. <laughs> Ben's going to keep me in line. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> OK, so what's post-term? Any baby born after 42 weeks. So remember, 38 to 42 is term. Anything before 38 is preterm. Anything after 42 is post-term. We don't see a lot of post-term babies because everybody's induced before they're due. Okay, But if you did, 12% of all pregnancies would probably be post-term. And remember that the big issue is that the placenta stops functioning. We call that it's matured. It stops functioning after 40 weeks. So it's not functioning to total capacity. So these babies can get the post-maturity syndrome where they have hypoxia. Whoops. Sorry about that. Hy hypoxia and they get malnourishment because they have had decreased O2 and nutrients. So your post-term babies can actually lose weight and they can become small for gestational age. So they lose weight in utero. And the way you know that is you look at their abdomen. And if they have little wrinkles that go across the abdomen with kind of some loose sub -Q skin, they have been heavier and they've lost weight in utero. They also, because of the fact that they're post-mature, they can pass meconium. They're more likely to pass meconium, just the stress of that post-maturity. Therefore, they're at risk for aspiration. Remember that thick, black, sticky, yucky substance in the amniotic fluid, and they are swallowing amniotic fluid, and they're urinating into it, so they aspirate. They get that meconium aspiration syndrome. So these kids are very large, usually, um, but they can have thin, uh, loose skin with little sub-Q fat because they've been losing weight. They'll have little or no lanugo or vernix. Remember the lanugo, that fine downy hair that you usually just see on their shoulders? They'll be just totally bald. They don't have it at all. And they have lost all their vernix, even sometimes out of the creases of the axilla and the groin. So they don't have it at all. They've, they've lost it. And because of that, they have very wrinkled skin and maybe peeling skin. So think about what you look like when you've been in the bath water too long, come out looking like a raisin. That's what they look like. And they'll have the, you know, the, usually the palms of their hands and bottom of their feet have peeled away, sometimes even uh, up on the wrists. And they can have cracked skin, um, long, long nails. They, you know, their nails have grown really long. Now, there is a higher mortality rate um, for these kids than full-term babies, but it's not as high as your pre-termers. Pre-terms still are the ones who have the bigger issues there. We try to prevent it, so we really, at 40 weeks gestation, want to evaluate that baby with a non-stress test to see if the baby is still healthy and they're going to start talking then maybe about inducing and not letting them go to 42 weeks, sometime between 40 and 42. Now, assessment at birth, you need to assess them for birth injuries because these kids are big. They've had time to grow more. They're more likely to fracture a clavicle. And clavicles are kind of meant to fracture so that something else doesn't. But as you're trying to get those shoulders delivered, they can fracture fla fracture a clavicle. So you should run your fingers along both clavicles. And what does it feel like? That crepitus feels like cracked eggshells under your finger. Exactly. And then we would just put their arm in a nice, you know, 90 degree angle, holding it close to their body. And we would actually put a t-shirt on them that is a lawn sleeve. And we pin it above and below so that it keeps their arm like this and it grows. Remember, their, their bones are so new, and so they've got this uh, very rapid growth, and therefore it heals so quickly. Yes, Soretta. Yeah, I have a question about the primary uh, capital. Yep. He probably didn't know. Right. Right. 
Right. Right. The OB docs usually don't know it, you know, unless they heard it snap, but it doesn't usually, they don't usually make a real loud noise. So the OB docs rarely know it. It's usually the nurse in the nursery doing that first assessment. So obviously the nurses didn't catch it right away, or they did and nobody told you. It's possible that they found it right away, but then that's reported to the physician, the pediatrician, and that's not an emergency issue to come in for if you delivered after they had already been there and made rounds. So when they see you the next day, they will tell you about it. Now, usually we tell the parents because they kind of wonder, why is this t-shirt pinned? You know, you have to tell them why you're doing that and, you know, what to be concerned about. Amazingly, these kids don't seem to be bothered by it. You'd think that they'd be having a lot of pain. Every now and then when you pick them up, they might wince just a little bit, but usually they don't seem to even notice that it's going on. Your biggest issue with your babies who are post-term is usually hypoglycemia because they have used up all their sugar stores. So your preterm babies have hypoglycemia because they don't have enough sugar yet, and your post-term babies have used it all up. So your biggest complication really is the hypoglycemia. You see that more often than birth injuries. What other birth injuries do you think you might see with these large babies that are post-term? The cap it? Yes. Okay. And that could be any that could be any baby, not just your post term. But they're more likely to have nerve damage, the brachial plexus um, injury, you know, of the, the arm for the from the brachial area, or even facial palsy just from the trauma of coming through that birth canal. So just realize that they have a bigger squeeze. And so sometimes the doctors are also thinking of inducing because it's a very large baby and maybe mom's pelvis size is not the largest. Okay, small for gestational age babies and large for gestational age babies. Remember, we have to, on admission, take a look at that baby's weight and length and head circumference, but also that gestational age assessment, that Ballard test that we do, we look at the ear cartilage, you look at the genitals, you look at all those other issues, um, and you determine what is their gestational age. Now we can plug in their height, their weight, uh, their length, we don't call it height at that age because they're just laying there, it's a length. So their length, their weight, their head circumference, their chest circumference, and then you can see, are they appropriate for gestational age? Are they within the weight range and the size range for a baby of that gestational age, or are they too small, or are they too large? And so this has nothing to do with preterm or postterm. They could be preterm, they could be full term, they could be postterm. But for some reason, these SGA babies failed to grow in utero. And when you plot them on that Denver developmental growth chart, they're going to be below the 19th percentile. When my son was born, he was in the third percentile. He was obviously SGA. And he had lost weight in utero, and he was teeny tiny. And anyway, he was growing. He made his own little growth chart, way below the growth chart. <laughs> <laughs> and until he was nine months of, old, of, of age, he looked like one of those starving kids in Africa where you could see every little bone and every little thing, you know. So I had preeclampsia with him. And there was abruption of the placenta, but probably during the second stage. When they looked at the placenta afterwards, they showed me there were th three big whiteout areas on the placenta where my blood pressure was so high, it was 260 over 110, mm -hmm. yes, that it was so high that it just abrupted. And so, but, you know, they figured there probably was some intrauterine growth restriction. And he's now healthy and normal size and, you know, um, smart and all of that stuff, sometimes too smart for his own britches. But anyway, um, just turned 39. So, th so there is life after all this, but you worry about them. But yeah, there he was in his own little growth chart. So very SGA. Um, etiology here, what causes it? Well, sometimes you've got kids who have some congenital malformation and then they just don't grow. Or there could be chromosomal anomalies, infections, poor placental perfusion. 
that's what was happening with SAM, poor placental perfusion. So when you have preeclampsia, PIH, that's what's going on. That placenta is not being perfused, so you don't have good function. Sometimes that placenta has aged. You know, it's matured and it's not functioning anymore. Sometimes it's really small. They really inspect the placenta because it tells you a lot about what happened in utero. So a very small placenta is not going to be able to supply what that baby needs. Or there could be like that separation or malformation. Lots of things like maternal illness, like diabetes or preeclampsia. Smoking causes low birth weight babies. Um, and drugs and alcohol can do that same thing. So again, treatment, the best treatment for all these things is prevention. Prevention by having good prenatal care. Routine prenatal care where we can monitor what's going on, catch it early. Most of these moms with preeclampsia, which is like our biggest complication, they feel perfectly fine. I can tell you that. You go in thinking, my blood pressure is going to be great today, and then they tell you it's like out of the, you know, out of the wall here, you know. So they feel wonderful. You don't feel sick. And you just think, oh, you know, nothing's going to happen, you know, but things do happen. Okay. So SGA babies, we need to know whether they're SGA because they can have the same complications as those babies who are preterm and postterm. So things like temperature, you know, reg regulation problems, the hypoglycemia, all of those kinds of issues. The only thing that's different is that these kids are mature. They're just small. Okay, so they probably have mature um, uh, body functions usually, but they're just small and they'll have some of those same complications. And then you have your LGA babies, those that are above the 90th percentile. Now, usually moms who have had a previous baby are more prone to having an LGA baby because babies tend to get bigger with each pregnancy. Um, but sometimes it's just that the parents are large. They're just large people. The baby is, it's all genetic. There are certain ethnic groups that have larger babies, but our most common reason you see LGA is that mom is diabetic, either gestational diabetes or um, diabetes mellitus. That's your most common thing. And because they're bigger, they usually have a longer labor, and then they're at risk for problems during delivery. Now, shoulder dystocia, normally that head is the largest diameter to come through the birth canal. Once that head delivers, the baby just slides out. Shoulder dystocia, not so. That baby, it's like they got great big huge football shoulders and you're trying to get that anterior shoulder out and trying to get the other one. And that's when you end up with the brachial plexus injuries. That's when they're more likely to have that. And remember I mentioned in uh, the Camtasia for high risk prenatal, perinatal when we talked about the intrapartum complications during the actual delivery, that shoulder dystocia, difficult delivery, how we use the McRoberts maneuver where you have her, you know, bring both of her knees up toward her chest and then you abduct them away. You're trying to widen that um, you know, pelvic area as much as you can, make as much room, and then we use the suprapubic pressure. So the nurse is going to put pressure over the symphysis pubis, suprapubic area. You're not on the fundus, because remember, the, if they're pushing on the fundus, that actually traps that head and doesn't allow it to be delivered. So it's important where they're pushing. So these are the kids, like I said, who can have those birth injuries, um, and hypoglycemia we talked about very common and also congenital heart defects are more common and there's something about that problem with the blood flow and those kids growing larger you know with the heart defects they don't really know a lot about it but that's where that mortality comes in treatment is to identify it early in pregnancy and then either induce earlier or do a c-section at delivery to prevent some of those uh, problems with the um, delivery, those injuries. As far as the hypoglycemia, we just monitor them, watch their blood sugar, feed them early. Maybe they get IVs to bring their sugars up, whatever they need. All of these kids who have hypoglycemia issues, preterm babies, LGA, SGA, they grow out of it. It's just usually the first few days that it's a huge issue.
Okay, so those post-term babies, remember the meconium aspiration syndrome, they're much more likely to have this because they have now got decreased amniotic fluid amount because they are in that post-term situation. So they're more prone to cord compression or intrauterine asphyxia. So when they have that stress, they excrete meconium. So remember, there's only one time that passage of meconium in utero is normal. When is that? Only one time, one situation. What did you say? Delivering. delivering, when they're delivering. Yeah, sometimes I'm thinking in utero, before they deliver, if it's a breach. Just that force of gravity with their buttocks down, even if it's feet breach, that's at the, you know, still their buttocks is toward the bottom end of the uterus. That's the only time it's normal. We still don't want to see it, but we know that the baby's okay if they're breech. We know they're okay, there's no stress. But we don't want to see it because they could aspirate it. But um, if it's any other time, we know there's something stressing that baby to cause them to pass that meconium. So let's find out what's going on, right? Because it can cause obstruction in the airway. They can get pneumonia, pneumonitis, and have problems with their breathing. So there's the etiology of why it actually occurs. You're going to see these kids when they're born. They're going to have tachypnea, cyanosis, retractions, nasal flaring, grunting, rales, ronchi, and they get a barrel-shaped chest as that meconium kind of builds up. But when you look at those manifestations, it's just basically respiratory distress, isn't it? Any kind of respiratory distress. So we need to do a chest x-ray, and they will confirm that. They'll see the atelectasis um, and the hyperexpansion of the alveoli. All right, so what are we going to do? If we note it in labor, they can do what's called an amnio infusion, where they actually will in, instill saline into the uterus. So she has to have ruptured membranes, and that's going to dilute it because you've got that thick, sticky, tarry stuff. We want to try to make it thin. So if they notice it early enough, they'll do that. At birth, they always intubate them with an ET tube. So they're going to go ahead and put the laryngoscope in, and they're going to put an ET tube down, and they're going to use that to suction meconium. They look at the cords, and if there's meconium there, they use the actual ET tube. Because can you imagine a little eight French catheter pulling up that thick, sticky tar? No. We have three ET tubes ready, and we have a special meconium aspirator that fits on the ET tube. And you just use that and suction, and you get another one ready to go, and they intubate. And they try to do that with the head on the perineum. Okay, so you imagine how difficult that is? Mm -hmm. You've got the baby's head on the perineum. You don't want mom to push because what happens when they get that squeeze of the chest? Baby takes that big breath when they get that, you know, squeeze. So we're trying to get all that meconium out as quick as we can. So best to identify it before that. And then they're probably going to need O2, and they very well may need to have a ventilator. So it just depends on how severe the situation is. We used to panic, panic, panic when we saw any meconium in the fluid, okay? And because amniotic fluid is clear, but it has almost like a clear yellowish to it. It's not a dark yellow, but it's kind of a real pale yellowish. Um, when you add meconium to it, you get green fluid. So when you'd see this green fluid, we would just panic. They now are saying if it's thin, these are the new guidelines for neonatal resuscitation, if it's thin green fluid, they're probably OK. And you probably don't have to intubate them. But if it's pea soup, that's thick meconium, and then they have to have some other way of getting that out. So we would try to that amnio infusion to make it thinner or have to do the intubation to um, suction right out of the trachea. OK, sepsis, that's what um, Kim was saying earlier about meningitis. It could be sepsis, meningitis, or it could be the urinary tract system, or it could be blood. But when these kids get an infection, it spreads fast throughout their body. When I worked in Green Bay, we had a staph outbreak 
uh, that just went rampant throughout our nursery, Staphylococcus aureus, which is what we have on our skin, right? It went rampant throughout the nursery, and these kids were sick, sick, sick. And we did what's called a cohort, cohort nursery, where we took all the babies that were in the nursery with that one baby, and they stayed together. And we actually had like little little nurseries connected to our big nursery. And then any new baby that was born went into a different nursery so those kids never mixed, you know, and so you kept them kind of isolated, if you will. They traced it back to one of the nurse's aides had an infected hangnail. And that's how fast infections can go throughout a nursery, and some of those kids were pretty critical. So it can be really, really scary. So we, it's, it's something we just take so seriously because it can um, become a huge issue. So staph is our one of our more common ones. E. coli, you can see where these babies could become infected with E. coli because it's not uncommon for moms to have you know, that contamination when you think about the vaginal canal where it is to the, the rectal area. But group B strep is the one we worry about more than anything. But Haemophilus and Listeria, you've got some other more common ones. But probably group B strep is the biggest issue. What do we remember about group B strep? Do moms show that they're infected when they have group B strep? No. We now know that moms are just carriers. Where do they carry it? Vagina or rectum, okay, and men in the rectal area. So even the perineal area too. So we have to think of group B strep like Staph aureus that we have on our skin. Many, many women or men have it internally and it does not cause any infection, any problem with them. They're perfectly healthy. They don't even know they have it except they culture it and find that they're group B strep positive. So when do we treat it? We find them, usually culture them around 28 weeks, 32 weeks sometimes. They find that they're positive. Do you treat mom then? No. no. Doesn't do a thing. If we treat her, she's still got it back because she's a carrier. When does the baby, when does it get transmitted to the baby? Right before delivery. Right before delivery. So they now know we're just going to treat mom in labor. So we treat her with what? Penicillin. Penicillin G, IV is the treatment of choice. And if she's allergic to penicillin, clindamycin. So, but penicillin is the one that you would want to remember. And she has to have at least one dose four hours before delivery. So if she gets it three hours before delivery or two hours, she's not been adequately treated or if she didn't have a dose at all. And as long as she's in labor, she gets a dose every four hours. That's adequate treatment to prevent that transmission to the fetus. So if we have a baby that starts showing us some weird signs and symptoms, low temp, now all of a sudden, a little bit of poor feeding, maybe a little bit of respiratory issues, and I look back and I see, oh, mom's group B strep positive, and she only had one dose two hours before she delivered, I'm going to get very worried, okay? And these are the kids we're going to jump on and do the septic workup. So I have seen a baby die in three hours after birth from group B strep. And it is a very, very sad situation when we could treat it. So we don't wait. We, um, any little sign, we're going to go ahead. So you can see your signs of septic, sepsis. But we'll go ahead and do that septic workup and start antibiotics because we can always discontinue them when the cultures come back negative. However, sometimes cultures are not totally, absolutely, positively perfect. Therefore, if that baby is still showing signs, they'll continue to treat the baby. And then the treatment is usually 10 days, 7 to 10 days of IV antibiotics. Okay, so early identification, antibiotic therapy, and they're going to need oxygen, right? If they're having respiratory problems, they're going to need more help with their thermal regulation. They're probably going to be hypoglycemic, so you're going to do those kinds of things um, too. Preventing spread of infection, that's that's not usually a huge issue because they don't have like an open draining wound. It's septic. It's inside. So it's not as easy to spread it. And of course, parents need lots and lots of support. 
Your hyperbilirubinemia, we talked about this in second semester, but the difference here now is we're talking about pathologic jaundice. Remember your normal physiologic jaundice occurs in every baby. After about 24 hours, that bilirubin builds up from that normal breakdown of the red blood cells. But your pathologic jaundice, the reason you know it's pathologic is it's occurring before 24 hours. So first 24 to 36, but it will show up before or at 24 hours, I, I should say. And that means that some other system, some other process is going on that's causing them to break down more red blood cells than they normally should. That normal hemolysis, but something else is causing it. And more likely, it is an incompatibility in the blood. So either an ABO or an RH and your RH is the most worrisome. Both of those, the mother's body is fighting off the babies, causing that red cell breakdown. So that's that hemolytic disease. The big thing we worry about is if the levels of bilirubin get too high, and you don't usually see that with the normal physiologic jaundice, but we could with pathologic. They get so high that the bilirubin actually goes to their brain and causes kernicterus and that is irreversible brain damage. So um, you can see the neurologic problems that they have, cerebral palsy, things like that. So we need to recognize it early. Um, at St. Clair's, they stopped doing um, cord blood studies on moms that are type O. They're only doing it on the RH moms because they said you'll, you'll notice symptoms if the baby is having an ABO incompatibility and it's not as serious. So you, we may see that in some hospitals, but at Aspirus right now they're still doing blood cultures, or not blood cultures, cord blood on moms that are type O or RH negative, because those are the ones who are going to be at risk. Okay, so your treatment is prevention of kernicterus. Identify it early, treat it. Those kids are probably going to need hypo, or, um, phototherapy, those special lights. And exchange transfusion, have you guys ever read about this, heard about this, exchange transfusion? I actually participated in two, maybe three, but I, th I know, remember two for sure, because before they developed phototherapy lights, that's all we had. And so it's kind of like dialysis. If you think of dialysis, how the machine is removing blood from the patient, putting new blood in, and you've got like 800 mils per minute with dialysis. So you've got like, what have they done? Replace the blood volume like three times to get out all the toxins. Well, that's what you're doing in an exchange transfusion, but you have two lines, just like you do with that dialysis, the uh, arterial and venous, and someone is pulling out like 10 mils. We usually do 10 mils at a time, and then you document that and then somebody replaces and pushes in 10 mils. But you do that so that you've replaced their blood volume three times. So you're trying to get all that bilirubin out of their blood. And so sometimes that is still done if phototherapy doesn't work. What? That'd be a little nerve-wracking. Yeah, 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 it is. Because you can't take all the blood out of them and then put all the blood in, you know. So you've got to back and forth. So um, it's removing that sensitized blood, and we use type O negative. So that's the universal donor, right? What's your own, what's your universal receiver? AB A, what? Positive. AB positive. Not very many people have that type, but a lot more commonly to have O's. So O negative, universal donor. If you have O negative blood, you know that the blood banks are calling you all the time begging for your blood. My husband's A negative, and they want him all the time. So you can imagine an O negative. Okay, your diabetic babies, moms from diabetics, they could be SGA um, because you've got that decreased placental blood flow. Um, so they've got the in IUGR, the intrauterine growth retardation, but more likely they are large. They're macrosomic, but they could be either one. So macrosomia doesn't just mean large. It means everything is large about, about that baby. They have an enlarged spleen and enlarged heart. So as you're delivering them, enlarged liver, they're at risk for a rupture of those. So you think about tra trauma during delivery. Now here's what's going on. You've got large glucose molecules that cross the placenta from 
mom to baby, but the insulin from the mom does not cross the placenta. Therefore, the infant increases its own insulin production to control the blood sugar, and that leads to that hypertrophy of those islet cells. And insulin, we remember, is a growth hormone, so it lays down layers of fat, and that's why those babies become so large is because of the fat stores that they are laying down from the insulin. But that's also why they're at risk for hypoglycemia, because their pancreas has been putting out so many large amounts of insulin. Now they're born, and they don't need all that insulin, and so their blood sugars are low. First 24 hours is when we worry about them the most, and that's when they might need an IV um, glucose drip. So they don't need all that insulin. So they'll have that hypertrophy of their liver, their adrenals, and their heart because they've got enlarged organs. Their length and their head size is generally within normal limits, but their body otherwise is big. They have a real round face, very obese body. Their skin is real red, so if you measured their hemoglobin hematocrit, they're usually elevated. They have poor muscle tone, and they might have tremors with stimulation, usually because they are hypoglycemic. Other risk factors, we talked about that trauma during birth. They also are at risk for asphyxia and respiratory distress syndrome. They usually have um, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia. What do you guys remember about magnesium and calcium? One word, sedative. Very good, sedative. So if these babies are hypo, they don't have enough sedative, right? So think about what they're going to look like. That's because they've got decreased production of their parathyroid hormone. Polycythemia, because that's in response to the hypoxia that they usually have, and then that hyperbilirubinemia due to the breakdown of the red blood cells, the extra red blood cells that they have after birth. So we need to control mom's blood sugar during pregnancy. What did we say on the Camtasia about mom's insulin levels? They change every trimester, right? So what do you expect during third trimester? What are her, her in insulin needs? What happens to her? Yeah, she has to increase her insulin, usually during third trimester. And then what happens right after birth? They bottom out. So watch her carefully. And so she, we want to try to keep mom's blood sugar as stable as possible. That's the best outcome for the fetus. Feed them early. And again, we want to give breast milk or formula. You could give them real small amounts of that D10, but don't overdo it. Gavage feedings if we need to. And we don't want to give them too much glucose unless it's a constant um, drip at a low rate. But you still have to watch too much glucose because they'll rebound. OK, questions on diabetes. Those are complicated baby situations often. All right, prenatal drug exposure. You know what I learned at this conference last week? We talked about cocaine being the big use. Uh, not anymore. They see very little cocaine. Now what do you guess it is? Heroin. Heroin. Some meth, some meth, but mostly heroin. And so as soon as you have something in a PowerPoint, it changes. Just realize I'm not going to test specific about a specific drug, but more so the, the care and management, what's the nurse's role in that? And when we look at the baby, it really doesn't matter so much what the actual substance is. They all go through this neonatal abstinence syndrome. And so any baby who has suffered that exposure, especially to opiates, and that's what we're seeing now. And when I talked to the nurses at the NICU in, in Wassa, and we were talking about this issue, and I said, so what are you seeing mostly? And they said heroin, some meth, and you know what's even more than either of those? No, methadone. Oh, yeah. Because we are getting very good at identifying these women, and they're getting into treatment. And we have a methadone clinic in Wassa, and that methadone clinic, the most prominent, common user of the methadone clinic is pregnant women. That's the, their most common patient. And so those babies, while methadone is still better than heroin, 
those babies will still go through neonatal abstinence syndrome. And what do you think is the likelihood that mothers are going to fess up and tell us the truth about what they've taken, how much they've taken? They don't. Many times they won't even say because they're afraid of prosecution. And that becomes a huge issue in medical care is our responsibility and whether you have to report it and then the worry about prosecution versus treatment. So big issues there. But just remember that um, many of them are using more than one drug and, that, and whatever they do report, you probably could double it. It's just like when they ask us how much caffeine you drink or how much alcohol you drink, usually people are, you should cut it in about half, you know, we don't totally tell the whole truth always. But you want to keep in mind what signs and symptoms you're going to see with the baby. And the nurses at the hospital, when they see these signs and symptoms, will go ahead and they can get a drug screen on the meconium stool or even the other stool, they can get a drug screen or on urine or stool without the parent's permission. So they can do that. Yes, Lanny? I have a cousin who, although she is black, a drug addict, <laughs> started out with re what they used to call reflex sympathetic dystrophy. So she yes. was on methadone for pain control and had two children. And both, and she doesn't have those kids anymore, my aunt and uncle do, but to, you had to, to wean the babies, you had to put methadone in their bottles. Mm. And let they, uh, what they, the doctor prescribed the, the amount, mm -hmm. and then let their weight wean them. As sure. They grew out of it. Sure. You didn't, it you didn't increase the dose; you just you kept it so you automatically decreased the dose by them growing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's how they handled that because I, I mean I was just really horrified, but that's yeah. How, wow. And they did pretty well with that as far as not having mm -hmm. to do because they knew going in that there was no method. Babies. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was the plan at hand. And they really didn't suffer too much. Right, for right. Them. We still do use methadone for these babies. So they have a neonatal abstinence uh, scoring tool. And there's lots of different ones out there. But they look for these different signs and symptoms. Um, diarrhea is, is a real prominent issue. So, you know, some of them have a higher score number depending on what the issue is. And so if they score at a certain level, they need to be treated. So they still do treat them with methadone. But just remember, these are the kids who are very irritable, very rigid muscle tone, that high-pitched cry, and they don't want to be held. Most babies, when they're upset, they want to be cuddled. They want to be, you know, and that quiets them down. These kids do not want to be touched. Yes, Tracy. Both, both, but most of the time right away, most of the time right away, yeah. And so, I mean, not immediately at birth, but within 24 hours they start to show signs, and then sometimes they'll continue to show s some signs later, but it's usually picked up pretty early, yeah. So drug therapy, like I said, could be yeah. used, um, but any of these, uh, even, even use tincture of opium, but methadone is probably the more common one, and that's not even on our slide. But just remember, they all have side effects, too. And so feeding becomes an issue because they don't eat well. Rest becomes an issue because they don't rest. They're irritable all the time. And then bonding with the parents becomes an issue. Sometimes uh, they are taken from them uh, so that they are not in their custody. So there are huge issues there. They really try to focus on treating the family, treating mom, getting her well enough so you can reunite, reunite the family. And we're always going to do a social services referral and let our social workers deal with all the legal parts of it. And we just follow what they tell us. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, sometimes. We know ahead of time, we get notification from social services that a particular patient is due. 
and we have specific legal already, you know, regulations of what we have to do. Maybe all the children have already been removed, previous children, from their custody, and this one is going to be also. So sometimes we know it way far in advance. Sometimes uh, we don't know, and then the social worker is involved right away in the birthing center. Sometimes that baby goes home. There's a red flag. They wonder. Social services continues to follow them, and then they get involved later. So it could be any step of the way. Okay, but usually they're involved pretty early. Yes, Tracy. So When they're taken from the parents, as long as they need hospital care, they stay in the hospital. When they're ready to be discharged, they go to foster homes. So it's, they go into the foster system, foster care system. Which, in some circumstances, can actually be a family. Right. Yes. Sometimes it can be other family members. Yeah. Soretta. Right. 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 They're in a catch-22 situation. Yeah. And we, we have to realize, too, that these women are, this is a disease. You know, the drug addiction is a disease, and they are addicted, you know, so. Okay, look at the stuff about fetal alcohol syndrome. I guess I would guess that you guys have probably had some information on this in psych, in your developmental psych and such, so you know about that. Just remember that each child, each subsequent child will have more exaggerated facial characteristics. You can look at three children from one family, and by the third one, everything is much more exaggerated, and the neurologic problems are worse. And then just know that sometimes we have chromosomal abnormalities that put our babies at risk. Your trisomy 21 is the downs. Um, trisomy 18, those are, that's usually incompatible with life. Um, but they can live for a little while sometimes. So there can be lots of chromosomal problems. That's just FYI for you. OK, so obviously we did it was a good idea Carrie <laughs> thank you Carrie it was a very good idea but I feel bad that you didn't get to the case studies so let me ask you one question are the case studies on the PowerPoints that are posted on Blackboard are the case studies in them yes. no, no. no. The okay yeah. so what I will do is I will post the PowerPoints that have the case studies in them and you can use that for help with your studying. Because I'm going to focus a lot on nursing care and management of these situations. OK? Not so much of the right, right. You need to know enough about the pathology, yeah. Going in to do those practice reviews, 